Why hasn't Liberland been developed? It's because Liberland is not developable land. The entire area around here is surrounded by wetlands. They've been identified as what are called wetlands of international importance. So there's a lot of reasons for habitat and stormwater runoff filtration and buffering the flood zones and stuff like that. Another concern is that the soils here are not great. They're classified as something called eutric fluvisol, which is also known as mud. And in this area of Lieberland, you have a lot of fine soils and silt and clay, which is not good to build on. The one thing the soil is good for is growing things, unless the thing you want to grow is a city. There's a lot of vegetation there. Over time, that vegetation dies, falls to the ground. So there's, we think, probably a thick layer of organic soil on top of it, which all has to be removed before you build. You cannot build on that stuff because it continues to decompose. Have I mentioned that it floods yet? Did I? Uh, Liberland floods. The water levels throughout the year, as I said, they get the spring melt from the Alps that comes down and floods this whole river basin. The difference here is, uh, what is that, 8 meters, 24 feet. However, you know, we're libertarians. We all yearn for this place, this free city somewhere in the world where we can go and have a minimal amount of government involvement in our lives. And the next best idea we've come up with is building in the middle of the ocean with seasteading. So when you start to think about that, Lieberland doesn't look so bad anymore. Welcome to An Architecture, episode 34. In our episode 31, we interviewed Daniela Gertovich from Archagenda, who is curating a competition, a design competition for Liberland. Liberland is an unclaimed parcel of land between Croatia and Serbia, which a libertarian politician has laid a claim to and is trying to develop into a new libertarian micronation. After talking to Daniela, we started getting some ideas for what we might be able to do with this place. And Joe and I decided to get a team together of some other libertarian-minded architects and engineers who some of our regular listeners might recognize from some of our other episodes. And we got a design entry together for this competition. We started working on this uh, in the summer and into the fall of 2020. At one point, the competition actually went on hold and they changed some of the dates and are rebooted in January 2021 with the final submissions due in May. We had kind of been keeping this quiet, partly because... One of the jurors was Patrick Schumacher, who was a uh, former guest here on An Architecture Podcast. You can hear our interview with him in episode 11. Patrick is the director of Zaha Hadid Architects, which is one of the world's premier architectural design firms. Plus, we had interviewed Daniela, and I had actually met one of the other jurors at Patrick's Startup Cities event with Adam Hengels, the founder of Market Urbanism, which we recorded for our episode 18. So obviously, we wanted to avoid any uh, appearance of impropriety or <laughs> favoritism from the judges because of our limited relationship with them. So we didn't announce that we were doing this. We just submitted the all the entries were anonymous. Um, although I wouldn't be surprised once they started reading through ours if they if they could have guessed where it came from. <laughs> A couple of jokers put this one together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, our entry wasn't quite as architecturally developed as um, most of the other entries. Yeah, we basically submitted an engineering report to an architecture design competition. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but part of the, the work we had done back in the fall was to really dig into some site analysis and exploring some infrastructure possibilities. And so we wanted to put that out there. We thought that that information alone might be helpful uh, in the future development of this place. And then based on that, we, we had developed a uh, essentially an organizational diagram, which is about as far as we took it for the overall layout of a city here that might be feasible. The winning entries were selected in June. There were five winning entries, as well as a handful of honorable mentions. And we were thrilled to receive an honorable mention. Yeah, I'm not really sure what they saw in our entry, but I'm guessing that they might have appreciated the level of detail that we went into with some of the site analysis and our consideration of all the various options for infrastructure, energy, and transportation. The winners were announced on June 13th, and two weeks later was Porkfest, the Porcupine Freedom Festival in New Hampshire, which I have sponsored and presented at in the past. I didn't think I was going to be able to attend this year, 
because we had some other plans, but those plans changed a bit. And so about three weeks before Porkfest, I reached out to them, seeing if they could get me in for a speaking slot. They couldn't fit me in on one of the main stages, but they were doing something this year where they had a lot of kind of pop-up venues around the campground. And so I was able to get myself booked at the NH Exit, which is kind of like Brexit, (laughs) which was a, a venue that was focused on secession movements. Porkfest this year was sold out for the first time ever. I think there were over 2,000 people attending. They had some of the biggest names in the libertarian movement presenting. I got this great picture of Dave Smith up on the stage talking to Angela McArdle and Pete Quinones with our logo up on the screen behind them because <laughs> I was a sponsor. Nice. <laughs> that picture alone was worth, <laughs> was worth the price of admission. <laughs> Tom Woods was also there, uh, Scott Horton, Jacob Hornberger, Bob Murphy, Anthony Samaroff. Stefan Kinsella, all these people that I have a lot of respect for in this movement. That sounds like some real heavyweights. Did you get to meet any of those guys? I did, yeah. Actually, uh, I I met Tom uh, in line for pizza at the pizza truck. (laughs) (laughs) Got to say hi to him. Stefan Kinsella I had met before at New Hampshire Liberty Forum, but I got to ask him a couple questions at his talk, and I talked to him briefly afterwards. Anthony Samaroff was actually... uh, renting an Airbnb room in the same place where uh, my buddy and I were renting a room. I also talked a bit with Eric Brakey, who was a former senator from Maine who had run for national office a couple of years ago. He had a great debate with Dave Smith um, earlier this year that's really kind of put him on the map. He's now involved with Young Americans for Liberty. And you know, I mean, the coolest thing about Porkfest is beyond that, beyond kind of meeting, meeting the, the stars you know, <laughs> of the movement, is just meeting so many other like-minded people. I hung out a lot with Goshi and Joe from the Engineering Tech Podcast, who we had talked to a couple of episodes ago about the role that uh, HVAC plays in buildings with COVID. And of course, Goshi and Joe were two of the team members on our Liberland design team. They gave a talk the night before my talk, more generally about how to provide power and infrastructure to autonomous cities. They had actually done a podcast episode of their own before we got them on board with the Liberland stuff, talking about that, which is worth checking out on the Engineering Tech podcast. I also got to have some great conversations with a handful of An Architecture podcast listeners. Were there some people there who aren't An Architecture podcast listeners? Not anymore. <laughs> well, I did have our logo up there with Dave Smith, so, you know, everybody should have seen that. So I can't imagine that anybody would not listen to us after that. Wow, look at that great branding. <laughs> So shout outs to Dustin, Jordan, Callan, Josh. I know there were some other people I I spoke with who uh, didn't get their names, but it's really gratifying to have people come up and be able to to have these conversations. I had a two hour conversation with a couple of these guys about our public space and property rights arguments. We're going to have to get back and do another episode on that at at some point. But just to have some people there who are kind of on our wavelength, like our our little niche wavelength here at Ann Architecture, and be able to get into some deeper conversations with them. It's just really rewarding to know that you're not just shouting into the void. <laughs> That's right. That it's resonating with some people. So that was Porkfest. It was a blast. Yeah, I'm hoping that maybe next year we can get out there for it. COVID willing. Is that what it's going to take to get you to come back to the States? <laughs> a Porkfest appearance? <laughs> All right. So for my talk, I was hoping to present the winning design entries for Liberland. But because they were just announced the week before this and Liberland, the folks at Liberland hadn't put together their formal press releases yet, I had reached out to them and they asked me not to present those just because obviously they wanted to you know, make the big announcements themselves. So I wasn't able to present those, but obviously I had plenty to talk about with our own entry. And since then, the winners have been more formally announced on the Liberland.press website. And we've put up a blog post linking to all of the winning entries on there. You can find that at anarchitecturepodcast.com slash Liberland award, or just go to the show notes for this episode and we'll link it there. Daniela on her Arc Agenda page had put out a, like a Facebook announcement with some images of some of the winning entries. And so what I did is at the end of my talk, I just put a screenshot of that up there with a QR code so that people could get to that Facebook post and check out those winning entries on their own after my talk. My talk was a little over an hour. We had about probably about 30 people. Um, you know, some people kind of came and went, but I'd say overall we had about 30 people there and maybe 10 to 15 people that hung around through the whole thing. And 
as you'll hear in the episode, we got into some really good, good conversation because it wasn't, it wasn't a formal venue where I'm up on a stage and they're down in the audience. Uh, we're literally like on the front porch of this little like mobile home unit in the campground. So it was a really good atmosphere to have that kind of a dialogue about the subject matter. And I was happy to see that it seemed like people were getting into uh, the discussion a bit. You can kind of see as I'm talking through some of these challenges of developing this site and the infrastructure, you can kind of see their wheels turning a bit. And as you can hear in my talk, they started offering suggestions and, and asking some really good questions as they started laying out some of our uh, development strategies. So the formal talk is a little over an hour. And then I, I, I left my mic on and we had some less formal conversation where we really got into some interesting stuff, uh, even apart from the Liberland uh, discussions. We talked a lot about private cities. I got to talk about uh, one example that, that I've always wanted to give a presentation about, which is Manchester, New Hampshire, which of course is relevant to Porkfest, which takes place in New Hampshire which I see as kind of a historical model of something like a private city. So you hear that at the end. Really good conversation, good back and forth. And I really appreciated all the questions that we got, that I got from the audience. To give a brief overview of my talk, I start by describing what Liberland is, uh, give a little bit of the history of how this boundary dispute came to be, both from changes in the Danube River over time, as well as political changes within the region. I talked about the design competition and how we got our team together. Then I got into some of the analysis we had done. I asked, why hasn't Liberland been developed yet? We talked about this a bit in our interview with Daniela. Obviously, flooding is a big concern here. And there are some other concerns there that we saw as presenting some significant challenges to the development of this place as a building site. But then we also talked about some of the opportunities that this place has, not just to be a, a, a well-functioning city, but to truly be an autonomous city. We talked about transportation. How can we connect to the region around it without being dependent on any one nation to get people and things in and out? We talked about energy, water, and wastewater, all these infrastructure components that are going to be crucial to the development of what is proposed to be a pretty dense city. And then I showed our design, our organizational diagram for where we thought they should focus on development, where they should locate certain infrastructure and transportation components, and what our thought process was as we developed this design. Another piece of the competition was to incorporate blockchain-based solutions somehow within the design. They're looking at blockchain as a critical part of their governance structure for Liberland. And so part of the competition brief included some incorporation of blockchain-based systems. What we proposed was a system of costs and credits that can incentivize certain development priorities and fund infrastructure development without necessarily relying on some kind of a top-down central plan. And finally, the last piece of the competition was to come up with a design for another parcel, which is across the river, it's about 10 kilometers downstream, a site that they call Napperdack, which Liberland owns. This is where they have their floating man festival each year, and they're looking to develop in the near future as a real building site. And in fact, one of the five winners of the competition will have the opportunity to negotiate a design contract to actually master plan and design that site. So we had a proposal for that site as well. What we proposed is something that only Joe could have thought of. Yeah, and in fact, it's the only piece of architecture we actually had in our whole submission. <laughs> and the engineer is the one who designed it. We're planning to come back in our next episode and do more of a deep dive on some of the key concepts like the blockchain-based systems. We had recorded a whole episode with our team back in October when the competition was put on hold to present the ideas that we had come up with at that point. And while we ended up changing the ultimate layout of the city and, and total design, a lot of what we had discussed back then really fed into all of the analysis that we put forward in our submission. So we'll present some of the clips from that discussion as well. One more note, you can download a PDF of Tim's slideshow and follow along. We'll also try to release a video version of this with the slides synced up to his talk. But we strongly recommend to download the PDF via the link in the show notes for this episode at anarchitecturepodcast.com slash 34. Here's my talk from the 2021 Porcupine Freedom Festival entitled Designing Liberland, How to Build an Autonomous City. Okay, so Liberland. Who, how many of you are familiar with Liberland? Okay, so I'm seeing about about maybe half or so. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a brief history of what Liberland is and why it's come to be what it is. So Liberland is this parcel of land between Croatia and Serbia on the Danube River. 
where there's been a border dispute between Croatia and Serbia about where the border is between those two countries. Um, and as a result, the you'll see, I'll go into detail, but the, the boundaries kind of zig and zag in and out of the Danube River. And so they've ended up with a piece of land on one side that Serbia isn't claiming because they claim that they own all the land on their side of the Danube River. And Croatia isn't claiming because they claim that they own some parcels on the other side of the river. However, if they give up the Liberland parcel, then that invalidates the other claim to the other area. So we've ended up with this little pocket of land between these two countries that nobody has claimed officially. And Serbia has actually said that they are, that Liberland's claim doesn't impact them. They're okay with it. Serbia's okay with it. Croatia, not so much. Um, they've actually, some of the guys here have, you know, tried to go to Liberland a few times. The Croatian border control has escorted them off of the property. So even though Croatia isn't officially claiming that land, they do seem to be defending it with their border control. So they're working on that. So just to, to give a, a really quick overview and we'll get into more detail. You can see the shape of it. It's a small piece of land. It's, it's only seven square kilometers and it's kind of a, like a teardrop shape. It's about a mile and a half wide by two and a half miles long. So not that big. I'm going to go through some of the history of how this place has come to be because that's going to actually inform some aspects of our design when we get into that. The story of Liberland is really the story of the Danube River and how it's changed over time. In prehistoric times, you can see this area in between the Alps, the Carpathian Mountains, and I think these are called the Dineric Alps um, in Bosnia and Slovenia. There's this kind of high ground with this low area in the middle. In prehistoric times, that was actually all underwater. It was, they called it the Pannonian Sea. And then as time went on, the sea dried up due to dinosaur-made climate change. And this is a map from the 1800s showing the flood zones in that area. So you can see that that whole area is still really low-lying, really wet. And there's a lot of water that comes down through here uh, from the Alps. Basically, when the, the winter snow melts in the Alps, it all comes down through this basin and you get a lot of flooding. This is a diagram. It's a little hard to understand, but it basically shows what's happened over time with the river. Before, I think, the 1800s, you can see that there were a, a lot of these different tributaries and stuff that fed into the Danube, and you had a, a lot of flow downstream. In the 1800s and 1900s and, and the 20th century, they started to do make a lot of changes to the river. People were creating canals in the lands around it so that they could irrigate their fields. There was a hydro power station, uh, a dam and, and a power station put in in Hungary just up the river. There was another one put in down the river. And so you can see that the flow of the river has really changed a lot over time due to man-made interventions in the river. What that means for Liberland is that you can see the light blue graphics here. That's the original path of the river. You can see it's this wide basin. It's really just kind of a floodplain that's wet. If you think about, if any of you are from New Hampshire, Maybe some like the salt marshes out by Hampton or Seabrook. It, that, that kind of a thing, right? It's just it's, it's flat, it's wet, and it floods a lot. And so you can see what happened is in 1894, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they came through and dredged a canal right down the middle of this wider basin with all these inlets and outlets. And so that created this straighter line right down the river. Of course, that's going to be the nature of the political conflict that's coming later with this border. So... Let's talk a little bit about that. The political history here is that before 1918, this was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And in fact, Liberland wasn't in either Croatia or Serbia at that time. Croatia, Serbia, and Hungary were all provinces within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the border of Hungary was actually below Liberland. Liberland was actually part of Hungary at that time. After 1918, World War I, the Austro-Hungarian Empire broke up. And you had the creation of Yugoslavia. It's a little hard to see here, but essentially this whole area, including Slovenia, Croatia, Yugoslavia, which is uh, now Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, this whole area was part of a new nation, uh, I think it was a monarchy, called Yugoslavia. At that time, they moved the, the Hungary border up above Liberland, so that's where you got Liberland now sitting between Croatia and Serbia. Now, they did at times try to sort out this boundary. So the biggest effort in this was in 1945. They put a whole commission together. This was after World War II. There were new political changes in this area. Yugoslavia went from being, I think it was a, still a monarchy of some sort at that point, 
to a federated republic. So each of these provinces, Croatia, Serbia, all the other ones, they each got a little more autonomy, but they were still under the umbrella of Yugoslavia as, as the nation. And so there was an effort to try to sort out this boundary here. And what they did is they went through and they looked at actual land parcels and they looked at the property deed records and they put a map together of where people had registered their property deeds. So in other words, some of these guys over on the Serbian side of the river actually had registered their property deeds in this province of, of Beli Manastir in Croatia. They were also looking at things like the ethnic makeup of these places. There's really a mixed population here, but there were some places that weren't majority Croatian, some places were majority Serbian. Some pla- there were a lot of Hungarians there as well, because again, it used to be part of Hungary. And so they were kind of looking at all those things and tried to come up with, with some way to resolve this. And what they said was that it made sense to have the border be down the center of the Danube River. And that's about all they said. The problem with that is that nobody knows where the center of the Danube River is. Because historically, the center of the river did this. It was winding all in and out. But then in 1894, they dredged this canal. And so Serbia now says, well, we own everything on the side of the the center of that um, navigation channel. And Croatia is saying, well, wait a minute, we have all these towns and things that are all you know registered in our land that are part of our part of our country and so in the 1990s after the fall of communism yugoslavia broke up croatia declared independence at that point this border started to become important uh, important originally it was just a provincial border you know nobody really cared that much to resolve it but now that it was a national border between croatia and serbia it started to become a lot more important and so, unfortunately, there was a Croatia declared independence, Serbia or Yugoslavia, which was primarily a Serbian, wasn't happy about that. They thought that Croatia was trying to create an ethnic national state of Croatians, which they kind of were. So then Serbia said, well, we don't want that. So then they attacked Croatia. They took over a bunch of territory because they decided that they wanted to create an ethno national state of Serbians which didn't work out too well for everybody. It was a terrible war. You heard about things like ethnic cleansing around Kosovo at that time. All this stuff was happening in the 90s, really kind of brutal war, bad stuff. This shows some of the things that were happening there. So the river is here. Serbia took over some areas on this side of the river. You can see zoomed in here. So at that point, Croatia was, uh, not Croatia, Liberland was wholly encompassed within Serbian-held territory at some points during the war. When the war was over, Croatia, they basically came to an agreement that they were going to go back to the way things were before the 1990s, before everybody split up. You know, they gave up on the, the whole ethno-national project, but they still didn't resolve the boundary. <laughs> so to this day, we still have this funny boundary that weaves in and out of the, of the center of the Danube River that these two nations are disputing. And as you can see, the only parcel that's on the Croatian side of that is this Liberland parcel. So Serbia is claiming everything on this side. Croatia is claiming everything on this side, plus these little pockets. But nobody has claimed that space. So I forget what year it was, but it was sometime. It had been like 2012 or so. A guy named Vic Edlika, who is a Serbian politician and a few other people, got on a boat, sailed across to Liberland, planted a flag of a new nation, which they called Liberland. And they have since then been working to gain recognition for this place. They've actually had... They've met with Serbia and Croatia. They have delegations in many different countries where they've been talking with people and really trying to do this right. I won't get into the details, but there are some United Nations definitions of what defines a nation. And Liberland argues that they meet all of those requirements. But Croatia is still not happy about it. My favorite story about this, about the, uh, the, the settling of, of Liberland, is that apparently when they went over there, you know, this is, this is like undeveloped, unsettled country, empty land, right? Apparently, there was some guy there in a pickup truck, like collecting wood or something. <laughs> and so, so Vit and these other guys, they made this guy a license plate for Liberland that he could put in his pickup truck and said he could come back anytime he wanted. Okay, so that's what's gotten us where we are with Liberland. Liberland, they actually did this in 2015, and they've done it again now in 2020. They had a design competition. This is going to be a, a new city, a new nation, and they need a design for the city. And so this past year, they, they created this design competition. We actually interviewed the curator of the competition, Daniela Gerdovich, on our podcast. 
And so, you know, here we are, a libertarian podcast talking about the built environment. We felt obligated to <laughs> submit something for this. So, sorry, before I get into that, so as I mentioned, I can't present the winning entries today, but I'll put this up again at the end. If you, you go into this, you see there's a Facebook post where they have all the, uh, some graphics of the winning entries posted. You can go and check it out. Very cool stuff. Very kind of futuristic, imaginative, inspirational, really cool architecture, cool designs, and, and really impressive renderings. And then there's this one, which looks like an eighth grade science fair project. That is our submission <laughs> to the competition. The thing that was so compelling to us about this competition is that by doing a design competition, it forces you to look at Lieberland as a real piece of land. It's a real place that has real constraints and real opportunities that can be developed within the design of a city. And so our focus was really looking at the site, doing some deep site analysis, looking at opportunities for transportation and energy and other infrastructure connections. We really kind of dug deep on those kind of things. So ours has kind of less of the architectural splash that a lot of the other entries did, but we thought that this was a worthwhile exercise to go through and really kind of get into this level of detail with the plans for Liberland. Quickly, this is our design team. Myself, my brother Joe is an engineer. He works on, he actually designs power stations um, over in Australia. And so that, that's helpful when we're trying to figure out how to get power in here. Goshi King and Joe Green sitting right here and here. They are free staters. They are mechanical engineers. Um, they design HVAC systems for buildings. So we wrote them into it. If any of you are familiar with Timeline Earth, which used to be called Friends Against Government, it's a podcast. Car Campit is a civil engineer. He helped us out too with some of the site analysis. And then we have a few other people. John Ellis is an architect who actually had interviewed me on one of our podcast episodes, which he was in architecture school. And apparently his entire class had to listen to this podcast interview <laughs> with me. So, um, but a good guy and it's a really thoughtful uh, libertarian and architect. Um, Palmer and Ryan, if you guys are familiar with Problematic Podcast, I don't think they're doing the podcast anymore, but they're still doing some social media stuff. They're a good follow on Twitter. Palmer and Ryan are both, are, were both architecture students, are now practicing architects. They helped out as well. And then Andy Baynow is an urbanism and transportation consultant. He has a couple of podcasts, one called Urbanism Speakeasy and one called How We Get Around about transportation. So he was uh, helpful to have on the team as well. And then he had a friend. He said, I got this friend who's, who's like a really creative engineer, uh, this guy, Matt Slaughter. He's done some really, really interesting real world projects. So he came in and joined us as well. At one point, the Lieberland competition took a break. There was some kind of technical difficulty that they put the, the competition on hold. We were working for a while with these guys. We kind of fell apart after that. They rebooted it in January of this year. We didn't really get everybody back together, but about a month before the competition, Joe and I said, we got to submit something. So we went back through all our information, put it together. But Andy and Matt actually um, actually forked off and, and decided to do their own design. So that's kind of the, the whole team there. So it's a good group of guys, good liberty-minded guys, and we had some really, really fun conversations with them. Okay. The big question here is, why hasn't Liberland been developed yet? Why is this land still empty available land in this what's kind of pretty good location right on the Danube River. There are a few critical issues here. The first is wetlands. As I said, this whole area floods. It's very flat. It's very wet. A lot of it is wetlands. I don't know how, you, how well you can see the satellite image here, but there's this, this green belt, um, this kind of basin that surrounds the Danube River down its length as well. This is another river, the Drava River, that comes into it here. And so there are these big wetlands areas all along that portion of the river. And you know, uh, for anybody who's ever tried to build something near a wetland, if you, you start building something near a wetland, you're going to get a knock on the door and a few people from the city or the state who aren't going to be happy with you. Uh, because there are good reasons to protect wetlands. They filter uh, stormwater runoff so that you don't get eutrophication of rivers. And here, the eutrophication of, of the Black Sea is a big problem where they get algae blooms and stuff from fertilizers running off from, from farmlands. So wetlands help to filter that a bit. They help to buffer the flooding a bit from the settled areas on either side. And obviously, they create habitat for lots of really unique habitat for different kinds of animals, like this really cute Eurasian otter and this really ugly sturgeon fish, which is actually um, no longer used to populate this area, but no longer, no longer does because of all the changes to the river. That habitat has been destroyed. So this is a real concern here of having these, these critical habitats destroyed. This portion of the river is actually one of the largest 
fish spawning grounds within this portion of the Danube. So it's you know it's, you can be like you can kind of criticize what, and I often do criticize wetlands restrictions for building, but here there's kind of a strong argument that these wetlands are really something special that should be protected and preserved. They've actually been designated as so-called wetlands of international importance by a, uh, an international agency called Ramsar. This one here, Kopaki Rit, Gorge Podunavolje. <laughs> and then this Duna Drava, Nemzeti Park, which is a preserve up the river. Um, these are some of the most important wetlands in each of these countries. And the fact that Liberland's surrounded by them suggests that we've got some pretty important wetlands um, here in the land of Liber. Have I mentioned that it floods yet? Did I? Okay. Liberland floods. Um, this is a chart showing the water levels throughout the year. As I said, they get the spring melt from the Alps that comes down and floods this whole river basin. And it varies from year to year. The, the red line here is the high flood level. You can see throughout the year, it really can flood almost any time of year. It tends to be more in the spring and, and early summer. But then they also have times where they have lower water, water levels. The difference from one side to the other here is, uh, what is that, eight meters, which is, what, like 20, 24 feet? <laughs> right, okay, thank you, the engineers. So that's a lot. <laughs> that's a big, uh, that's a, a big distance to try to deal with when you're trying to deal with developing the land and trying to figure out where your flooding is going to be. So this is an analysis we did of the topography, looking at those flood levels, and what does that do to the actual land area? I don't know how well you can see this here, but we've the green areas are high ground that are above that maximum flood level. The light blue areas are the high flood level, which is, I don't know if you can see, but it covers about half of the seven kilometers of land. When they have their worst flooding, you know, 100-year storm, 100-year flooding, half of the land is, is underwater. So this is a challenge. And, and even though it's 100-year flooding levels, that's happened as recently as 2006 and 2013. So this is a, a real... Like current day problem in this place. And then the average flood level, you can see here in the darker blue, that's where you can expect that to be flooded pretty much every year. And again, it's still taking up some space here on, uh, on the land area. So that's a challenge. So you could say, well, okay, we have these flood areas, but it's all pretty flat and low lying. Couldn't we just bring in some soil and just, just build it up and, and just get ourselves up above the floodplain and, and be off to the races? One concern there is, is the wetlands, as I said. You know, we want to try to preserve some of those wetlands. Another concern is that the soils here are not great. They're classified as something called eutric fluvisol, which is also known as mud. I don't expect you to understand what this chart's showing, but it's basically showing the particle size of the soil within these areas. What happens is you get, with all this flooding, it moves a lot of soil around. You have a lot of erosion from upstream that comes and gets deposited down here. And in this area of Lieberland, you have a lot of fine soils and silt and clay, which is not good to build on. Um, you want like like well mixed, like bigger sand and bigger gravel particles to get a really good um, base to build on. Besides that, the one thing the soil is good for is growing things, unless the thing you want to grow is a city. So they, there's a lot of vegetation there. Over time, that vegetation dies, falls to the ground. So there's, we think, probably a thick layer of organic soil on top of it, which all has to be removed before you build. You cannot build on that stuff because it continues to decompose, and it's no good for building. So the idea of coming and bringing in more soil to build up Lieberland, we're really going to have to do that just to get to the grade it's already at in order to build in this place. So that's a challenge. So to sum that point up, why hasn't Lieberland been developed? It's because Lieberland is not developable land. <laughs> However, you know, we're libertarians. We all yearn for this place, this free city somewhere in the world where we can go and have a minimal amount of government involvement in our lives. And the next best idea we've come up with is building in the middle of the ocean with seasteading. So when you start to think about that, Lieberland doesn't look so bad anymore. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about some of the opportunities of this place. Again, Lieberland wants to be an autonomous nation. It's surrounded by two other nations, and it's actually very close to Hungary at the north here. But it's got some things, it's got some things going for it. For one thing, the Danube, this portion of the Danube River is classified as an international waterway, and it empties out down to the Black Sea, which can get you back to shipping lanes throughout the world. 
So that's a big plus for Lieberland. That even though it's kind of landlocked, um, they actually do have can have an international port there where they don't have to go through customs and border control of another country if they're coming up the river. Yeah, go ahead. Are there any locks or bridges? Or <laughs> there are. Yeah. So I mentioned there's some hydropower dams above and below Lieberland. So yeah, that's a challenge for River. I'm going to talk about that a little more, but that is a challenge for Lieberland. I'm sorry, but yeah, go ahead. I, I, might, I missed the very beginning of this. Is this yep. actually not claimed by any country? So it is. Croatia claims basically a boundary line that looks like this, and Serbia claims a boundary line that looks like this. And so this is the only portion of land. Yeah, it's disputed. It's the only portion of land on the Croatia side that neither side has directly claimed. Because if Croatia claims it then they would essentially have to give up other land parcels on the other side of the river, which are more valuable and they don't want to give up. Um, so, There's a real chance you actually make a libertarian society there without a government coming in and putting guns to that? They are working on that. That's the idea. And they're doing it very, very diplomatically. They have delegations that they're meeting with other countries, meeting with Serbia, meeting with Croatia, having these talks. He also said Croatia doesn't want to around the So the Croatian border control is kicking people off of this land when they come and try to hang out there. So even though they're not officially claiming it, they're not happy that people are, are there. Yes, yeah. So this is a long-term project. But the design competition, I think one of the real benefits of it is that, it, again, it starts to paint this picture of what this place could be and what some of the benefits could be for that region. So this is kind of an economically depressed region. It was really destroyed in the wars in the 90s. It's not very productive land. There's, this, there's, there's agriculture here, but there's not a lot of urbanization and industry. So for Lieberland coming in here, they can bring in investment from all over the place, as well as invest in infrastructure throughout the region that they need to access Lieberland, but that will also benefit a lot of the areas around it. And so by having these ideas in place and these designs in place, it can start to show these other places, like this is what this place is going to be. It's going to be someplace really special. You think of like, like a Singapore or Hong Kong and the benefits that those places have for the nations around it. It's really, you can create a lot of win-win solutions for these surrounding nations that hopefully will will get them on board. And it's so small that there's no fear that they're going to have some like big army or something here, you know what I mean? <laughs> like there shouldn't be like a national defense threat to the other the other nations. But a couple other opportunities here with infrastructure, we're going to have to get stuff from somewhere. We do have the international waterway. We could get fuel up there, but if you want to travel on roads, if you want to get train connections things like that, we're going to have to be going through these other places. Um, what we don't want is to have one country that can cut the cord to Lieberland if they're unhappy with us. But since we have Croatia, Serbia, and even Hungary right up the river, there's an opportunity to get connections in from three different countries so that if anyone decides they want to cut the cord, you might still be served by, by the other nations. And I'll elaborate on that as you go along. And again, another opportunity here, there are environmental challenges in developing this place, but I think that Lieberland can really model what it means to develop a dense city with concern for the ecology and the environment of these wetlands area and really become a steward for this whole Danube River Basin. Okay, transportation. So obviously we want to start thinking about roads. You're going to have to have roads to get in here. Really the only place to do that is through Croatia. We could get a bridge over the river to Serbia, but as I mentioned, you've got this wetland that really wraps around Lieberland, a big wetland preserve wraps around Lieberland on that whole side of the river. So the idea of putting a bridge across there, I don't think is going to fly. So that means that we're going through Croatia for our, our road connection. It's actually good. There's a bridge right, right up the river here that connects over to Serbia. So we still have good connection from Serbia and obviously from Croatia there with our roads. And you can travel uh, through the river actually, like on the river? Yes. So the river, the river is pretty well traveled there both for passenger travel and for ship. Have you ever seen these, like, like the Viking cruise ships that go on the Danube River, like from Germany? They had those kind of things down in this area for passenger travel and, and actually for cruises. There's a lot of ecotourism in this area with the wetlands. And so passenger travel on the river, shipping on the river, those are all things we can do here. However, again, with the environmental sensitivity here, for, if we're significantly increasing the traffic on that river, I think that's going to be a point of contention with, with the other areas around it and the international organizations that are, that are looking to preserve this, this place. So we can think about trains. This map here, the red lines, show train connections in the area, which if you can get to, there's a nearby town called Osijek, which has good connections to Zagreb in Croatia, to Belgrade in Serbia, 
and all the way up to Budapest in Hungary. However, we don't think it makes sense to bring a train into Liberland and have a train station there. Trains take up a lot of space. They cost a lot of money. They're inflexible. Our preference would be for bus service. We could have buses coming in and out of Liberland and taking you to the train stations that aren't too far away that can then get you off to the rest of Europe. And then, of course, there are airplanes. We didn't think it made sense to develop an airport on the land of Liberland because it's so small, because of some of the environmental concerns with the animals and things. However, there are some opportunities for airports. For one thing, there are international airports, as I said, in, in Zagreb, in Belgrade, and in Budapest. There's also a little old military airfield right across the river that is, doesn't seem to be in use, um, or at least not, not heavily used. I think that, I'm not sure if Liberland has talked to them about this, but there seems to be some interest there in making that an airport that could be accessed pretty easily from Liberland. So that could be a really cool opportunity. Another thing we thought about is if you're coming to these airports, you still have to go through customs and border control of one of these other countries before you get to Liberland. Is there anything we could do to get to Liberland from an airport without going through Croatia or Serbia? And one thought we had is there are actually a couple of airstrips. We found one up to the north and one down to the south that are right on the river. And these are small little private plane airstrips, but they're on the river. And so you can imagine that maybe if you had an international terminal on one of these airstrips that just connected to a dock onto your boat in the inter international water of the Danube, maybe that would fly as international travel to Liberland without going through uh, customs of Croatia or Serbia. So. I don't know if that would fly, but, it, but that's kind of the way we're thinking about these things is how do we get people and things here without being dependent on these other bordering nations? Is it a river from the <laughs> You're ahead of me. So, yeah, we could land right on the river. This is a picture of a seaplane here. This is like a 19 or 20 passenger seaplane. It can land within, I think, about, I think it's like maybe 300 meters of, uh, of let's say, runway on the river. They could land right on the river and get you right into Liberland. That's kind of a cool thought. Concern, again, there's still a concern there about disturbing the habitat in the area, but I think for a few limited flights, it, that could work pretty well. Obviously, helicopters from any of the other airports, you could helicopter into Liberland. That's probably going to be for the high rollers. And then there's actually, this wouldn't necessarily be international travel, but there's a really good bicycling network throughout Europe called the Eurovelo Cycle Network. And the trails run right past Liberland on both sides of the river. So you could actually get on a bike here and ride from Liberland to the Atlantic coast of France <laughs> on one of these cycle trails. And this is, this is a pretty popular um, thing for cyclists throughout Europe. Yeah. Is that underwater for part of the year? I think so. I think they've created some high ground there, but I'm sure that when they get high flooding, I mean, the towns around here and stuff flood at, at certain times. Like in 26, 2006 and 2013, a lot of the towns around here flooded. And so it's, it, it, it's a challenge, but, but it's not always flooded. So there are times when it can be used just fine. Another thought is, well, we can't get a, a bridge across, a road across to Serbia, so maybe they let us drop a couple of poles down in that reserve and put a gondola in. <laughs> so the thought here is, you know, you could get in from Liberland, a gondola, over to this little town here in Serbia. You can imagine people commuting into Liberland to work. They could go and park there, hop on the gondola, have a nice scenic flight over the, uh, over the wetlands areas. This could also be a, a good opportunity for ecotourism in the area. It could be a real attraction. Get into Liberland. You know, maybe you could actually extend that all the way to this airport if they do start using that airport. And maybe you could get Serbia to agree that once you're in the gondola, it's still international travel. <laughs> I don't know if, they'd, if they would go for that. But again, these are the kind of things I think we could think about as what are some outside of the box ways to get connections here. And then, of course, you could have a connection over to the Croatian side as well. The problem with gondolas is they're, they're really slow. But again, very scenic. <laughs> Okay, so that's transportation, energy. So um, Goshi and Joe last night actually gave a great little talk about this kind of stuff, more generally talking about how to power a private city, how to get self-sufficiency and resiliency in a private city. And so um, I'm just going to go quickly through some of these. We can certainly talk. There's a lot of, of detail we could get into here, as they talked about last night. So your first impulse is to say, okay, we don't want to be dependent on these other places around it. We want to make this place self-sufficient for energy, right? We want to generate our own power on site so nobody can literally cut the cord to Liberland. So one option might be solar panels. We looked at solar. Unfortunately, this actually most of Europe has pretty 
poor solar insulation, the solar exposure, it's actually about the same as it is here in northern New Hampshire. Until you get to like southern Spain and, and Italy and stuff, there, there's not great solar exposure in Europe in general. And the same is true here in Lieberland. So it's not very productive for solar. And even if we covered, we did the math on it, like if you covered 25% of the land area with solar panels, you're only generating a fraction of the power that you need for this place. And all those nice wetland plants that we're trying to preserve, you know, then we want to save that sunlight for them. So solar panels, it could be a small piece of the puzzle. You know, they could be on rooftops and things, but we didn't think that it was worth really prioritizing that for energy generation. Wind, uh, you could put up a couple of wind turbines. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm a solar developer and yeah. all of our projects are in Maine. Yeah. We use bifacial panels, which is the water we collect the light off of. Oh. What's also interesting is in Maine, they actually have where you can convert forested wetland to what's called meadow wetland. So mm -hmm. you're planting uh, like hydro seed underneath it, and that counts as a conversion. It's yeah. one to one. Um, so I, I, I would implore you to, to look at that again. I also think that. Um, you see this sometimes on like, I mean, they're building solar on brownfields, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. I would put the solar all on the 50% and it gets flooded. Just build solar there. You could even put them on floating uh, things so they could rise with the sea. Yeah, no, and that when we thought about that, and we are still proposing solar as a piece of the puzzle here for the energy puzzle, but we didn't see it as, we didn't think it could do everything we needed to do. Thinking about the solar resource, I mean, like Maine, New Hampshire, not great solar resource compared to Florida, but in Florida, electricity is sold for 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Up here in New England, Massachusetts, it's 18, 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Whatever you're about to propose, I'm sure that the cost of energy is going to be extremely expensive. Yeah, that's definitely possible. Yeah, no, thank you. That, that, that's a good discussion. All right, so wind, similar thing. It, it takes up a lot of land area to get a lot of, of wind generation. And the problem with Liberland is there's almost no wind here. <laughs> We found a wind map of Croatia. There's a lot of wind over on the, on the um, Adriatic coast. But once you get over this part of Liberland, it's like less than 0.4 meters per second average wind speed. It, it's just, we just don't have the wind here. Water flow along the river, what's the... Yes, so hydroelectric. The challenge with hydroelectric is that in order to make that work, you really need to have a height differential from one side to the other or to back it up and create a reservoir. We didn't want to back it up and create a reservoir because, for one thing, the, with the flooding, it's a challenge. Also, it's going to flood all the areas around it. So we didn't think that was possible. Some people have proposed like what's called a run of the river power station. It's basically like a water wheel. And you just don't get much, much power out of those, unfortunately. But we went down that path <laughs> a little ways, right, Joe? But um, at the end of the day, we kind of came up empty on it. The tidal movement to the river, right? The yeah, I mean, I think if, yeah, the, the river going up and down. I mean, I, there, so like in the ocean, you can do that. You have tidal power generation. It's kind of a cool tech. Well, you flood the other guys out. <laughs> right. So then another one before, while well, I'm still on renewables, geothermal. There's actually a, a bit of geothermal ex exploration in this region where people, they drill down. And once you get deep enough, you get hot enough temperatures underground. You can pump water and pump it back out. You get hot water. You can use that to convert to steam and run a turbine that generates power. That might be a possibility here. It actually might be a really good possibility. The problem is you spend a lot of money trying to find out if it's a good possibility because you basically have to drill the hole and then you may or may not have the temperatures and things that you need there to, uh, to make that work. So, but it, it, it's something worth considering. Okay, so then that, that's kind of exhausts the renewable generation options. Oh, sorry, one more. Biogas, this is your trash incineration or, or sewage incineration, things like that. There's a possibility there to generate power from that. This is actually the, the type of station, power stations my brother designs, is these kind of things. But he says you don't get much from that. Like a sewage treatment plant generates about enough gas to power the sewage treatment plant. That's about it. So <laughs> it's a cool thing to do, but it's not going to power the whole, the whole city. Okay, so that gets us to the non-renewables, uh, the fossil fuels. So diesel generation, I think when they first get there, they'll probably be running diesel generators, but they're probably not going to build a whole power station to power the whole city on that. Natural gas. There are some pipelines around here, but it's going to be a project to get a natural gas pipeline into Lieberland. We did find some locations where we could do that, but that's a little bit down the road. That's maybe kind of 10 years into the development here. And then nuclear. You mentioned nuclear. That could be a good option here. There actually, there's a nuclear station just up the river in uh, Mohawks, Hungary. Um, so that suggests that there's a fuel delivery route, that there is a waste removal route. That's a way to get, get the nuclear fuel in and out, and that there's technical expertise in that area. So that could be an interesting opportunity for on-site power generation. And you can actually get these, what do they call Joe, micronuclear? Yeah. 
it's like a containerized, you think of like a shipping container that has a nuclear power plant in it. And for the size of what it is, it can actually generate a decent amount of power. So that could be a, a really interesting opportunity for this place. But at the end of the day, the simplest and probably most reliable thing to do is to bring in power lines. We have electricity all around here. Let's just bring in power lines. But the way we want to think about that, again, we don't want any one of these countries to be able to cut that cord. So we want to think about making connections from Croatia, from Serbia, and possibly even from Hungary. So for one thing, we can get a 35 kilovolt line in from an existing power line here. Just as this little stretch right here would be the first thing we could do, just a small, it's like a few kilometers to get a line in from an existing power lines in Croatia. So that seems like a pretty good option to, to get off the ground, get up and running. As the population expands, they're looking to build up to an uh, ultimate population of 120,000 people, which is a little bit bigger than like Manchester, New Hampshire, just to put that in perspective. But again, this piece of land is a lot smaller than Manchester, New Hampshire. It's like putting the entire population of Manchester in the mill yard or in the downtown area. We'll get to that later. Yeah, go ahead. Would you run 220 volt or 110, the power of freedom? <laughs> For my generation, there's an answer: two twenty, two twenty-one, whatever it takes. <laughs> so, Left the joke on the end. Mr. Mom. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Mom. There we go. Uh, yeah. Is it bigger than uh, like uh, Vatican City or? I don't know what to compare it to, but it's about a mile and a half wide by two and a half miles long. That puts it in perspective. So, I think it's bigger than Vatican. Yeah. So as, as, we, as, as it develops, we need to get more power in. We can extend a longer line to get 110 kilovolt power from Croatia. We could also extend a longer line and get 110 kV from the town of Sambor in, uh, on the Serbian side. So at that point, now we could have two connections, one from each side of the river, where it doesn't no longer make sense for one nation or for Croatia to cut the core because then we're going to get the power from Serbia. It doesn't affect us. So, so by having that redundancy it kind of takes that possibility off the table, the incentive there, for Croatia to kind of hurt Lieberland by, by cutting the power. It creates different incentives of, like, uh, price comparisons, and, like, they'll mm -hmm. get all the service. Yeah, exactly, and then you can, you can shop around for your price. Exactly, and they're actually served by two totally different portions of the grid, so there's probably different price differences there. Although, another good thing about the electricity here is that Europe has one of the most interconnected electricity grids in the world, and Croatia, Serbia, and Hungary are among the most interconnected nations within that grid. So that's that's a good thing for Lieberland. There's an international organization that manages that grid. So again, it's not like one country manages the grid. They'd have to kind of go up the ladder there before somebody decided to pull the plug. Yeah, go ahead. Are you going to talk about fiber internet at all? Yes, I think we had a note about that in our presentation. I guess our thought is if we're bringing power in, we can try to get fiber in that way as well. You know, once we run the lines, we get the right, right of way. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Am, am I correct in assuming that it just wouldn't be economical to build a power station for library land specifically? No, it could be, but then you have the challenge of fuel delivery, right? You either deliver your energy in on a wire, or you deliver it in on a boat, or through a pipeline. Right. And so, Something like economy of scale. Yeah, I, I think at some point, and we actually, I'll get into that on my next slide, actually. At some point, it is going to make sense for them to have some onset generation, I think. Uh, okay, I think I covered that. So. What's that? Yeah, and even if they were generating their own, they're probably still going to be tied into the grid there. But again, it's a safeguard if somebody ever, if there ever were a problem with the grid. That's you, you can't like that idea. You just have a little bit of everything to be an experiment. Right. It's almost like decentralizing your your inputs, right? Your energy inputs. Um, one more thought on this. Oh, legacy infrastructure too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one more thought on this is that you could also think about. I mentioned there's a power station up the river in Hungary. You could bury a cable down the, the middle of the river and get a power line into Lieberland that way. So now you have connections to three different countries. Problem there is this river is regularly dredged. As I mentioned, it was man-made in the first place. It floods. It's, there's a lot of erosion. So the idea of putting a, a, a power line on the bottom of that is probably not going to fly, but something we thought about. Okay, so here we go. This is how we project the energy mix going over 50 years, assuming that they build out to their full 120,000 population over 50 years. Initially, they have some diesel generation, a little blip right here. Then we get that power line in, the 35 kV, which is a green here. Um, we could start to have some on-site generation, which is the pink here. That's natural gas, once we can get natural gas on-site. And then we bring in 
the 110 kV lines, one from Croatia, one from Serbia, and we have solar as the little yellow strip down at the bottom here. So again, we, <laughs> we there's some possibility there, but we didn't see it as really being able to give Lieberland energy independence, let's say, but it's, it's part of the mix. Real quickly, heating and cooling. Once we start to do power generation on site, there's some interesting opportunities there for heating and cooling. You could start to do cogeneration. So basically you have, you're generating power, you have waste heat from power generation. That can be used to have a centralized heating plant where you could circulate essentially hot water around the town. And instead of each building converting electricity or fuel to heat within their building, they can access the hot water from the centralized plant and can be more efficient for their own heat generation. We looked at a, another number of other options here. I'm going to move along that, but Joe and, and Goshi can answer questions on that when we're done and people have more questions on that. Water and wastewater. A lot of people along the Danube get their drinking water from the river. We think that can work fine here, so that's what we would suggest. Lieberland also does sit on a pretty, uh, I guess, a pretty good underground aquifer, so that's also another opportunity to drill wells down. Wastewater. The one thing we want to be careful about here is that the way to deal with wastewater is you treat it, and it goes back into the river. We want to really make sure that if we're doing that, that we have some really kind of enhanced treatment measures so that we're not contributing to that eutrophication downstream with algae and stuff in the river. And sorry, in this little graphic here, again, like the nuclear power, you can get containerized water treatment and wastewater treatment plants that could be useful for the early stages of developing. Okay, so that's kind of the whole regional energy infrastructure development that we did. Now I'm going to get into the architectural design. Yeah. <laughs> now, that work that you did, did other groups do that kind of work, or are they going to use your work? Right? <laughs> um, I haven't had a chance to re to read the other entries yet. They haven't published like the full scale entries yet, so I'm sure everybody did a little bit of that, at least thinking about it. I seriously doubt that anyone did nearly as much uh, exploration here as we did. They wanted to build the buildings different than you did. They yeah. Use all of this. Right. Right. Yeah. That was our intent. You know, we we thought that we could kind of um, contribute something to this whole effort by doing that level of analysis and trying to to solve some of those problems. Okay, so this is the design that we put together. The first thing we looked at, of course, is the flooding. And I'm back to this graphic I showed before. Again, these blue, these low-lying areas, which are under the, the high flood level, we said, let's just leave those alone. We're not going to touch those. Even though this is a small place, we're going to make it smaller. <laughs> this is our, we're going to make that whole thing a wetlands nature preserve, which we have named the Tom Woods Woods Nature Preserve. <laughs> we spent more time naming things than we did designing them, as you'll find out. What that leaves us with is some the green spaces here, our ground area that's above those high flood levels that we see as optimally developable. And so we simply kind of drew those boundaries and made that the outline of our city design. <laughs> Central Park. Yeah, yeah, it gets better. <laughs> so you can kind of see a little, a little 3D here, give you a sense of scale there. These are the 3D here. These are maybe like eight to 10 story buildings. So it's, there's some size there, but because we've really shrunk this down so much and we're trying to get 120,000 people in here, it's a pretty dense city in this little area that we're developing. And so we have an area on the, the west side here that can all be open for development. On the east side can be open for development. You know, maybe you have a little stadium or some other kind of public amenities. And then in the middle, we kept this area open as what we're calling Decentral Park. This is a low spot on the site, so we thought it made sense to just, to, again, not to try to build that up and build on it. Plus, it's a nice open space within the middle of what's otherwise a dense city. We have a ring road around that, which you can see. Um, well, first of all, this is all very walkable. This is like less than a mile from one end to the other here, and maybe like, I think it's like a, a, maybe a mile and a half from like this point to that point. So the whole city's walkable. But we thought we could have this road around the middle. That could be, you could have some kind of buses or public transportation just looping around that and moving people around. The name of the road is Who Will Build the Road? <laughs> um, Does it translate into Croatian? <laughs> I don't know what that is in Croatian. but All right, so then we have, then we start to think again about some of the infrastructure parts and pieces. There's a little island here that we're proposing that we kind of connect to that and create a protected marina there. We build this up like a canal wall, a retaining wall there and create a protected marina within that space. This would be for personal watercraft, and maybe some, some like larger passenger boats. But then we have a large wharf here, which again, for all that, that river shipping, we want to create that opportunity there for that to come in. The kind of boats they can get here, they, they have barges. So you can get like a convoy of six barges that are pushed by one kind of tugboat thing. So you can actually move a good amount of stuff around. 
All right, so then coming up the loop here, we wanted the wharf with that transportation and shipping to connect to what's a transportation hub here that connects to a road up to Croatia. This, again, it's high ground. This seems to be the best place to make that road to Croatia where we're not crossing over this little stream in the back or crossing over wetlands on the other side. So we put that pin on the map and said that's going to be our transportation hub. So we have shipping, we have transportation there, as I said, buses, all this stuff can happen there. We could have a heliport on the roof, which we have not named. It is an unnamed heliport. It's not named after anybody. Yeah, suggestions. We are not taking suggestions on the name for the heliport now. I'm sorry. Ben <laughs> <laughs> well, it should be something that starts with an H, don't you think? Anyways, the Croatian border control, you know, they could have their space in there. Liberland would not need to have a border control coming into Liberland because border controls are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> then as we move along here, we have a hospital, the Ron Paul, Dr. Ron Paul Medical Center, of course. We have our emergency facility, and we're just kind of zoning this out here. Obviously, these aren't the size of the buildings, but we're just trying to define these zones. Our emergency services, so we have um, fire services, we have ambulance, we have dispute resolution agencies. They're not police, they're dispute resolution agencies. We then have our water treatment plant, our wastewater treatment. The water treatment plant is the Jürgen von Bambavirk Waterworks, because it kind of rhymes and we had to use the name for something. The wastewater treatment plant is the John Maynard Keynes sewage treatment plant <laughs> because, like John Maynard Keynes, it is full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> the electrical, and then we have a, a power station here. So a substation, once we bring that line in, and that could be a parcel where we could have some um, power generation once we get to that point. Where does the ambulance take it? Um, to the Dr. Ron Paul Medical Center. <laughs> and, you know, one opportunity here... <laughs> So all these things we have lined up on this north, this Croatian side of the site, you could have the opportunity for vehicles to access it from both sides. So you could have people from Croatia being able to come in and access the medical center without having to necessarily get into into Lieberland. Great yeah, as well as you know shipping and, and things for the the water treatment plant and stuff and stuff up here. So that's kind of our our big picture organizational diagram. That's about as far as we got with it. We didn't really push it forward to develop the buildings. Like, what is this place going to look like? Oh, one more thing I forgot to mention. These are uh, gondola stops around. We did get the gondola in there. <laughs> Line over to... <laughs> Mine too. How much, How like, if you're going to eight story tall, Yeah. Uh, how far have you guys thought that you'd have to dig down to get to stuff that you can build on? Uh, so what you're going to get into there is probably deep foundations, so things like piles. There are, you know, you, you can build in, in clay and stuff. You just have to, you spend a lot more on concrete underground to do it because basically... Instead of just sitting on the ground, where the problem with clay is that it can move around when it gets wet. So basically, you put a pile that goes down deep. So you're relying on, on the friction along the length of that pile to hold the foundation in place rather than just sitting on top of the, of the soil. So it is doable, but it's, again, a challenge. Yeah. How do gondolas compare cost-wise compared to other forms of transportation? I think they're expensive. Cable? Cable? Things that go on like cables? Like when you're yeah, exactly. Like it's skiing. Yeah, like when it's skiing. Right, right. Well, we could have those too. We got a river, but yeah. They're probably not cost effective, but here, if it actually does become a means of people like commuting and using it for ecotourism. Tourist attraction, like, I mean, it, it pays for itself on a ski slope. Yeah. Which is a strange environment. You're a strange environment. Right. I would go there for, I, that would be, I think, the best selling thing yeah. for a tourist. Yeah. Which you need. Yeah, exactly. And so, that, so just um, one thing to answer that is that there are some cities that have gondolas in them, Porto and Portugal. They have, they have this, this high bridge up on a hill, and then it goes down to this, this area in front of all the port wineries. They have a, a, a gondola cable car thing that goes down from there. Rio de Janeiro, Portland, Oregon. Yeah, Rio de Janeiro, Portland, Oregon, yeah. Um, so it, it is something that's used. Actually, in uh, New York City, they have uh, the Roosevelt, Roosevelt Island um, cable a car. Pattern. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, so it can be done. Uh, I don't know how cost-effective it is, but... You know, this is Lieberland. We're building in the north. Is it, is it much more difficult to build roads in this kind of environment? You have to do more subgrade preparation, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah. We're going to be building the roads up. So when it's not flooded, you can get there. There's actually that bike path that, that goes down. That's probably going to be our right of way to get in here without disturbing any areas around it. And so you can get down in there. And people have used this land in the past, apparently, like for hunting and stuff. But I don't know if it's ever been farmed. Anyways, it's not real, uh, not real developed. Just a close-up of some of that in, those infrastructure pieces. So one thing we thought about here is part of the goal of this competition was to create a master plan for this city. The problem with creating a master plan is that 
once you put it into place, it becomes this rigid kind of thing that you say the roads go here, these buildings can be this tall, these uses go here, commercial stuff's over here, residential stuff's over there. We didn't want to do that. And in fact, the, the part of the, the competition brief said there's no zoning here. <laughs> so we took that to heart. And we said that what we're going to do, we don't want to define that rigidly, but we need to create some kind of incentives to get to the density we need here to be able to eventually serve the population. We, we think this would be a fast-growing place. As you said, maybe over 50 years, maybe they reach that, that 120,000 population. So we don't want somebody coming here and claiming you know, 10 acres of land and putting a house on it as their own house that they've homesteaded and saying you know, nobody else can build on top of that. So what we've argued is that we could incentivize de that density by putting into place what we're arguing could be like a blockchain-based decentralized autonomous organization, which is essentially a smart contract where you could create some incentives for developers coming in. We're arguing that basically nobody can sell this land. Liberland doesn't own this land, even though they're claiming it as, as part of their area that they govern. So it's not like Liberland can just sell land to developers. People should have the right to come in and homestead it. However, there need to be some limits on how that's how it's homesteaded. And we justify this. There, I won't go deep on this. I could, but I won't. <laughs> Within homesteading theory, there are ideas that there's a concept called encirclement, where basically you might say if there are areas developed around a parcel that's not developed, that the last guy has to allow an easement for access to somebody else to get in and develop that parcel. There's also a concept of a technological unit, which is to say that the amount of land you can homestead you know, out in the Midwest, which isn't as productive for agriculture, might be larger than the parcel of land you could homestead in eastern areas where that's more agriculturally productive. So there's been some discussions like that. Yeah, go ahead. Would it be a global DAO or Lieberland specific citizens all voting? So the, the idea here is that this would be for, for developers. It's something that they would put in place. There would need to be some kind of government's mechanism there. I don't know who that would be. But you would put in some kind of, some kind of people that set this thing up and set the parameters for it and would be kind of administering it. But then once it's set up, because it's a, a blockchain-based thing, people have the confidence that it will continue to be used in that way without this board that's governing it just changing the rules at some point. Right, so. right. Yeah, good. What if you have some sketchy Chinese corporations come in and buy the whole West Side? <laughs> well, so, so part of that might be that, that one thing you could do is maybe there are some limits on the size of a parcel that somebody can buy and develop at one time. And that's something that could be managed through one of these DAOs. What we're proposing is that essentially you're not selling the land to somebody, but maybe you're saying if you're going to come in and develop an acre of land here, let's say two acres, let's say it's about 100,000 square feet, right? That maybe they say, okay, well, you, you need to pay into this, into this DAO, um, into this blockchain. You need to pay in $10,000 per, I'm sorry. I did the math on this before I not forgot. Let's say it's like $1,000 per square foot or something. So now you've paid... What did I say? $100,000? I'm sorry. Let's say a dollar per square foot. We'll make the math really easy. Dollar per square foot of land area you pay in, right? Now, you get paid back floor area that you actually develop. So if I have a 100,000 square foot site, I pay in, uh, what did I say, a dollar? All right, we're gonna, let's make it $10. So I've paid in a million dollars for this site, right? Now, if I, build, if I build one floor and cover that whole site with one floor of usable space, I get $100,000 back. If I build two floors, I get $200,000 back. Mm -hmm. If I build 10 floors, I get all of my money back. So you can create this incentive for people to build to a certain density. And not only that, but if I build 12 floors, I get extra money back. I get credits back. And the way that we find it is that as other people are coming and building, they're paying into that same system. And then those credits are going to the people who have built more square footage earlier on in the process. And so again, it's a way to create that kind of incentive for density without saying you have to build a 10-story building here, minimum, you know, or you have to build this much floor area per your land area. So, yeah, go ahead. So presumably in order for the, in order for it to comply with the ethos, this has to be voluntary. Yep. So what's the incentive to comply with this, especially early on? Well, no matter what happens here, there's going to be somebody who's going to be saying who gets to develop here and who doesn't. If somebody just goes, like if somebody just goes there now and starts building something, I would think that Liberland, Liberland, you know, the organization, will come and say, hey, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. We have plans to develop this place. We haven't been able to do it because Croatia has been kicking us off every time we try to get in there. And so they could say, look, we, we have a legitimate claim to this place. However, we've been prevented from developing it. 
So I think then they could take that developer, right, someone who just went and started building something, they could probably take them to court and say, look, we have a more legitimate claim to this place than this guy does. We've been planning this for years. We've, you know, we've put all this stuff in place. This guy just showed up and started building something. Is it not a court? Like, yeah. to have done something is what to plan something? I mean, I've been planning for 10 years, something called Lieberland 2. It's definitely something that we just come up with now. Yeah. Kind of, uh, I, you know, before, you know, decades even. But what kind of like a the timing of kind of a plan I think is not exactly a very strong claim on a piece of property. The way I see that, yeah, I I hear what you're saying. If people had been allowed to come in and develop this from the get-go, you know, like when people settled the West, right, in the U.S., it's like there's empty land out there. Uh, well, it wasn't empty, of course. Native Americans, there was a there was some problems there, but there was land people could get to and set up a homestead. But nobody else had any kind of competing claim or conflict there. I mean, the whole reason to honor homesteading is that it resolves disputes between people who might have competing claims for the land. Right now, Lieberland has a claim on this land. It's not necessarily that they own the actual land parcels, but they're saying they're saying that they they are going to be the authority who's, let's say, making the decisions about what land claims are valid and what land claims aren't. So if they had, if people had been allowed to just go in from day one and start homesteading this, I think it could have happened that way. Because it hasn't happened, and now there's this built-up, pent-up demand for it, I think that that, again, this technological unit that I mentioned has gotten really small, that the amount of, of land that somebody could go in and develop, people have to say, look, there's a whole lot, lot of people who want to do stuff here. This can be really productive property. We should only allow people to claim a parcel that's this big, let's say. Um, otherwise, they're not honoring that technological unit, that they're not taking the land to its most productive use, or even to its... That's the most productive, but to a an optimally productive use, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Might it be better if Lieberland just incorporated itself as a private corporation, claimed all of this land, and then sold shares? To That's very possible, and that might be what happens. They're actually working with so we've on our podcast. We've interviewed Titus Gable from uh, Free Private Cities. That's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to have companies, not just in Lieberland, but companies go to places, find pieces of land, negotiate to have a special economic zone for the piece of land and go in as a corporation, as a company, and become the administrator of this property. The difference between that and a government is that they would have an explicit written contract between themselves and the residents or property owners of that city that would define that they're going to provide these services to them, whether it's security or, or infrastructure or whatever they're doing, roads. And so that's exactly the free private city model, which is very compelling. So that's a real possibility, and it makes a lot of sense here because it is so small. But we were trying to go beyond that and say, well, could we still make the homesteading principle work here for individual parcels on this small place with this dense demand? And we saw this blockchain thing as a way that we could, that we could do that in kind of a different way. You know? uh, we would need a lot more development to get to the point where everybody you know, accepts it. So that's one thing we're looking at. Similar, like things like open space, again, instead of creating a street grid, you could establish a DAO with, with priorities for saying, we're not going to have roads here, here, and here, but we want roads to be spaced about this far apart. And basically, if you build a big parcel and you know you have to go a mile from one, one road to the next, then you're going to have to pay for that. So again, people who are kind of spreading out and not creating public space might have to pay into this system. And people who are creating public space on their parcel, or at least defining their parcels in ways that that roads and rights of way and, and other public spaces are available around that, um, they might get credits back from this system. So that's a way to incentivize open space without creating a rigid, a rigid street grid. Similarly, with environmental mitigation, we think that they should do a really in-depth environmental analysis of this whole site before they do any development and establish some establish what are the problems with development, how can those be mitigated, and kind of put a system of costs and credits in place for those kind of mitigation activities that could be used to fund environmental protection in Lieberland itself, as well as all up and down the Danube River, so that that could, or this portion of the Danube, so that you start to build goodwill with the environmental groups around it, and they don't just look at this and say, you're building a city in a wetland, stop. You know, We could say, look, at, we're building a city in a wetland, but it's generating all of this revenue, all these funds that we're going to use to invest in the environmental projects in the places where it really matters along this river, where you guys want this stuff to happen. Like we're going to be, not only are we going to like, like help you with that, we're going to take the lead on that. And we're going to become, as Lieberland, the stewards of the ecology along the Danube watershed. 
So why do you want to do that? I, I just got here, so maybe yeah. you over. Oh, well, I don't think we can episode. redo it. <laughs> I'll just say briefly. <laughs> I'll just say briefly. The entire area around here is surrounded by wetlands, and they're they've been identified as what are called wetlands of international importance. And so there's a lot of reasons for habitat and stormwater runoff filtration and buffering the flood zones and stuff like that. There are a lot of benefits to having these wetlands here. The most environmentally conscious planned out thing on the Danube because you're yeah. the newest thing. <laughs> yeah. Everybody yeah. think you do it. Yeah, I think it can really set an example. You guys want to enter the Euro. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, so Liberland, they have... They they have their own cryptocurrency called the Eurozone for countries. You know. Yeah, I don't know. I would think they would not be interested in that. I think the whole point here is to trade, to not do that. <laughs> but uh, uh, they're going to want to make trade agreements, and as I said, they are negotiating with a lot of these countries. And I think they've had talks even with people from the EU about what they're trying to do here. All right, one more thing. The block. Oh, I have one more thing after this actually, but. Another possibility with these blockchain DAO types of systems, one problem with building a city like this, especially building it rapidly, is creating the head-end infrastructure and then paying for that because you have to put a lot of investment up front to build like a power substation or to build a power generation plant or the water treatment plant. And so we're proposing that you could have another blockchain-based decentralized autonomous organization that could be set up like a kind of a bond or an investment fund where you could have an interest rate that increases over time. So essentially, someone comes in, the example I gave here, let's say it's a $100 million project. But what we want, initially, we only have like, you know, a thousand people to pay for that. And so we can't just have those people paying, let's say it's a 20-year bond, we can't have those people paying 5% of that every year. It's a ton of money up front, and no one would be able to pay for that. So what we've said is, well, we could have this bond type of investment thing that has an interest rate that increases over time. And we're going to try to align that, the increase in the interest rate, with the increase in the population. So as the interest rate is going up, the population is also going up. There's more people to pay for those higher interest rates. And so by the time you get to the end of, the, of this bond, you now have a lot of people paying this interest rate. So the idea is to maintain a, cons- a level payment for each person each year for the build out of these systems that could eventually fund or pay off the debt for the initial investment. The example I gave here, we've got a $100 million investment. We have each resident paying $300 a year. We have a 20-year you know, twenty year bond or whatever. And we start with, let's say, I think I have about 10,000 people. We started this, right? By the time we get down to the bottom, we've got almost 80,000 people. By doing that, each person, this red line here shows that each person is only paying $300 each year until that bond expires. The payments back to the, the bond issuers are going up every year. In fact, they're getting more and more. So later, obviously later in the life of the bond, they're getting more and more money back. So the payback, the payback I have here is about 13 years. We could mess with the numbers and, and make that a little bit better. But at the end of the day, I have it, they, you know, the investors get 131% profit over the life of this loan, which I think annualized is like six something percent, you know? So, so you can imagine, and there's a lot of stuff you could do to fine tune this. But this is a way, I think, to balance the risk of those initial investments between investors, between the utility provider, and between the users, the people who are coming and moving here, where you could, by changing the interest rate and some of the terms of it, you could put more or less risk onto the users. You know, Maybe they need to pay more if, if enough people don't move to this place. You could put more or less risk on the provider, where maybe they maintain this level payment for the users. And then if they don't get enough growth in the, in the town, then they end up having to pay the additional amount to the investors. Or for the investors, if you want to shift some risk to the investors, then you say, look, at this This is what you're getting. Uh, or I'm sorry, you'd say that that interest rate, even though it's increasing, that maybe that's variable to some extent. So if they don't get the population they think they're going to get, maybe that interest rate doesn't increase as much. And so there could be ways to balance the risk here between the investors the utility providers, and the users of that system. So this is something we were playing around with there. Last thing, another part of the competition, there's a little piece of land down here on the river, on the Serbian side. There's a town called Apatine, and a Libra land has actually owns, they've purchased this parcel right on the river there. They have a, a festival that they call the Floating Man Festival, which is kind of like a, like a Burning Man kind of thing, kind of like Pork Fest that they do every year. That's where they do that. I think they've, they've looked at doing some forms of development, like an incubator, a startup incubator, that kind of stuff. And it's actually an ideal location to have a port on the mainland where you can have that river shipping back and forth to Liberland. It's only 10 kilometers downriver. So 
our solution to this is it's, it's this kind of little tourist attraction area. Um, my brother does power station design, but he used to work installing planetarium systems around the world, the projectors, the sound systems. And so he came up with this idea of the Libertarium. Which is, the bigger picture is that it's kind of a museum of liberty kind of a thing. But the, the focal point would be this full dome theater, planetarium kind of thing, where you could have, in addition to having all kinds of different shows and content, you could have, as Liberland starts getting developed, you could have people um, doing 3D models of these places where you could come into this place and with a group of people w fly through or walk through Liberland in this, it's not virtual reality with the goggles, but it's virtual reality in a projected space. You could walk through the space and so investors could come in, they could say, see what their project's going to look like there and really get a sense for what this place is going to be before they, they invest in it. So that could be a, an interesting little uh, amenity there. The test case, or it's a little step. Right. What's that? They already own it, so it's already a little. Yes. No. This is. It's really. I mean, the fact that they that they own that parcel, it's really a a, a good kind of foot in the door in this area. And again, they can start to build that goodwill by creating some investment, even just on that parcel, where where the broader region starts to see, oh, they're really like bringing in like creating some businesses here. They're bringing in some investment. They're investing in some of the infrastructure and the waterfront stuff. So. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting opportunity. If you take the ugliest piece of rock disaster <laughs> and fix it up, nobody has a problem. With that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Good little boom. Yep. Yep. Take garbage dump into a tourist track. Uh huh. Okay, so thank you. That is my presentation. I know I've gone long, but um, hopefully it was interesting. I'll stop there. Again, I'm Tim Brochu. My podcast is An Architecture Podcast. If you just Google An Architecture, you'll find it. Actually, this little QR code here is our um, is it will get you the link for the website. My business is Audra Architecture LLC. I do work all through New Hampshire. I have done work with free staters before, and I'm always always looking forward to. These days, I'm doing mostly residential stuff, just working with homeowners on additions and renovations and some new builds. That's kind of my bread and butter these days. So I've done institutional stuff in the past with another firm, but that's kind of what I'm focusing on now, just kind of keeping it small. So yeah, if anyone's you know moving here, buying here, wants to renovate, wants to build. Love to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I specialize in that, yes. <laughs> okay, sorry, one more thing. So, again, I said I'd put this up again. If you want to see the other winning Liberland design entries, this QR code will get you to a Facebook link where they've posted some images of some of these things. Definitely check that out. ARC Agenda is the organization that curated this competition. It's on their Facebook page. You can check that out. Go through. Again, really cool stuff. Did I, I don't know if I mentioned, so there were five winners, so it's kind of one, two, three, four, five, and then they had a handful of honorable mentions. We actually got an honorable mention from it, so we were, we were thrilled with that. Um, as you see, look at the other ones. I mean, architecturally, they're head and shoulders above ours, but we're glad that the effort we put in on some of the uh, infrastructure analysis, hopefully they got something out of it. Yeah. I'm not getting it out of, sorry if I disrupted okay. anything, but uh, it was a really interesting talk. Do you have this up anywhere or the general information? We will put it up. I'm, if I did everything right here, I'm recording it. So we'll put it up as a podcast episode on our podcast feed. Again, An Architecture Podcast. You can find it on any any podcast apps. I think guys that chat also find it interesting. Yeah, great. No, thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear. It has the Tom Woods seal of approval. It does. Yeah, that's true. I have. I. I can. I've been on Tom's show twice, so I consider him. A, I consider myself a recurring guest of the Tom Woods show. Recurring <laughs> week, pretty soon. I, I, I'm waiting for that. I gotta go talk to him after this. Yeah. He's right over there. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. That's what I have. Any other questions before we break up? Yeah. Some of your podcasts, you've mentioned uh, some projects by towns and, and localities, they neglect to factor in the maintenance costs of certain projects. Yes. Uh, would you just continue, like if the taxes are basically at $300 a year and it just goes on for, for you know, uh -huh. maintenance costs? Or, or? Yeah, again, so I think, so like we did for the infrastructure, the idea there is that that's the money you would invest to build something initially, but you could do a very similar thing to um, to start funding those maintenance improvements before they need to happen, and so yeah, that uh, we think that that could be a good. Um, so you're you're probably thinking of strong towns, right? And what they call the growth Ponzi scheme. We're actually kind of making that explicit here, <laughs> right? We're creating a, a a financial instrument that says we think we're going to grow this much. And as I said, what you can do there is then you can start to balance the risk between investors or users or or the infrastructure services, so that what happens now is whenever a town has to do maintenance or invest in a new project, that all gets charged to the taxpayers, right? It all comes out of taxes. There's no risk to the city itself other than, you know, 
they're managing the taxes, but ultimately the taxpayers are paying for everything for that when it needs to happen or, you know, they bonded or whatever. And so we see this as a way that you might actually be able to fine tune that process a little bit so that, yeah, so that it, it starts to create some better incentives around the longer term maintenance, as well as the, as we said, the initial initial build on some of this stuff. I think it was a lost opportunity. It should be the hoppy and physical removal hell pad. <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. The, the hell, I'll, I'll say again, the helipad is not named after anybody. Not, not, it's not named after any libertarian philosophers or economists. Uh, it is the unnamed heliport. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Are we still doing questions? Are we all there now? Yeah, I don't have questions. I'm happy to keep talking. Sure. So. Kind of like a... Like a, I know a bit about sort of historical squatter states, you know, okay. kind of a, I live in one that started that way, Utah, you know, kind of just founded as an illegal squatter state in that area, kind of like by the Mormons and moved out west, yeah. you know, fought a couple wars with the government. But, and, you know, like another example, which has some pretty close parallels would be Kowloon Walled City yes. kind of in Hong Kong. Yeah, that's but a really cool place. Of, I think that both of those cases had some advantages that we don't really have here for legal land. I mean, like a... Mm -hmm. Once you build, you know, a free market city with, you know, better regulation, that provides a comparative advantage to all the regions around it. Mm -hmm. But what's the step one? The step one for somewhere like Utah was that they were able to make money first off of just, you know, the industry because they had all the land to develop. And second, as a stopping point for people heading to California. So they got, you know, they were the ancient equivalent of a gas station, you know, <laughs> water and supplies for people sure, to sure. buy. Yeah. And in Kowloon Walled City, it was manufacturing kind of with cheaper commercial rents for people in, you know, much higher rent Hong Kong. Yeah. And, you know, illegal dentistry and, you know, stuff like that. All kinds of illegal stuff. So yeah. what's, what's the, what's the jump off point? Because you, you can't get all the way to that giant development. You've got to start with a few buildings that make a profit. Yeah. So what's the starting point? Do so nice that's yellow. where that's where this this master planning process um, helps with that analysis. Actually, some of that we, we had worked out some phasing. Um, we actually we started this without this all this analysis. It was just some like kind of uh, headier or more like uh, just kind of wilder architectural ideas. Mm -hmm. Our initial concept was we were going to do these because we didn't want to disturb the ground plane too much. We thought let's do these like big tall spires, and they'll have kind of buildings like hanging off of them by cables and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And that didn't really pan out once we, once I did the numbers on the uh, the structural loads there on the scrappy <laughs> soils. <laughs> um, but we've kind of had some fun with it. And we, we had thought I about... Al yeah, I can, I can almost picture you doing it. You know, it's like San Francisco, you know, like one of the Bay, the Bay Bridge. They had to go way, way down to get to the stuff. Yeah. You could build a monstrous bridge and then have a town on the bridge. Yes, yeah. On both sides. Yeah. Long yeah. ways, but colossal. Yeah, there's an interesting pool somebody actually on the Brooklyn Bridge. That's just like a thought experiment. Yeah, like yeah. How you could like turn the Brooklyn Bridge, the whole thing into like a city that's own. Yeah, because then because yeah. it is, it's complicated. So right, what I would right. say to that, how do you phase it? I think one of the first things you want to do is bring electricity in, right? Yeah. Well, well, let me hold on. Let me back up. Real small scale, um, houseboats, right? You, you bring people in. This, they actually yeah. the floating man festival is called floating man because they have a houseboat there that they've set up as like a hotel mm -hmm. that people can come in. And again, it's like a little tourist attraction. So you could you could have houseboats in the river, maybe work on that marina first, so you get a little bit of protection from the current and flooding. So houseboats, um, some initial, like, let's say, small settlements, just people going and living there, and maybe they're able to commute in and out to other parts of the area around it. Then I think at some point you're going to want to start to develop that head-in infrastructure. So we think the power line in, you want to do that as soon as possible. It's not that hard to do. We think it's not going to be that contentious. It doesn't really disrupt any, anybody or anything else. And probably not that expensive to do. So we think bringing that power line in, once you get electricity on site, then it becomes a lot easier to do a lot, a lot more stuff. Then you can start to have some, you know, some, some more commerce. Um, you can start to it makes construction easier. <laughs> and then as the population grows, you know, once you get beyond, once you get even to like a thousand people, you're gonna want to start to have like a water treatment plant, sewage treatment. We mentioned like you could do like what package systems early on. What's that? What are the first 50 people going to do? Because there's got to be 50 people before 1,000. I mean, you could possibly do some smaller-scale septic kind of stuff. Um, but sooner than later, you want to have a proper, because of the environmental sensitivity here, you want to have a proper a proper treatment, plan, especially for the sewage. You know, they, they could do wells, wells and septic initially, but I think that you want to try to build some of that better head end infrastructure, sooner, especially if it's going fast. Yeah. I think with this, the fact that it's... We're in an internet connected world now that there's so much international interest mm -hmm. that there are people that are going to be willing to contribute 
you know, millions of people willing to contribute small amounts, it's going to be able to um, help those pioneers that are the first 50, so that they're not the ones paying the cost. That there's enough people that just have the passive interest that are going to be able to, you know, put in 10 bucks or 100 bucks or 1,000 or whatever, but that kind of covers the difference in the, you know, the fact that you can't homestead the same way that, you know, yeah. yeah. So, so Liberland has, as I said, they're building this parcel lot for 120,000 people. They have had 600,000 people apply for citizenship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there are There's a lot of people yeah. interested in this project. And as you said, once they are comfortable that they can do this without interference from Croatia, I think there'll be a lot of investment interest. In a lot this of people place. are interested in living in a developed anarcho-capitalist, you know, kind of city. But before then, you have to get 50 people to live in shacks in a swamp. And like, yeah, I think I think there'll be pioneers that are willing to well, do that part so time. Well, so I don't know. I don't know about that. Well, I think, be I think the free state project. project. Listen, yeah. I think a small percentage of a hundred, uh, six hundred thousand people are definitely willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And even if it's part time, like for the summers or whatever, I think it's yeah. And Airbnb, also, I wouldn't go as far as, as to say shacks. Also, like, mm -hmm. it's not that hard yeah. to do things like uh, house houseboats, like mm -hmm. houseboats, house boats, for example, and similar. And beyond other that, things. fifty people have to get there, and then you know you don't have to have the environmental activists convince the police. No, I do. To round I do up, join your criticism. Yeah. I, I do join uh, your. I think, you know, I'm not the first skeptic you talk to or the, you know... The, you no, know, believe, the believe, this point. whole thing is an exercise in, in skepticism, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's again, the, the reason we like the competition is that to a lot of people, I think mm -hmm. Lieberland is this this kind of imaginary place, right? Yeah. Um, and so by, by looking at it as a real building site, it's like, well, no, we could actually, you can actually do something here, and you could have some really strong benefits for these countries around that are that are kind of contesting it. Like, this could really be a special place that could have a lot of benefits for the years around it. You know, I think even something like just putting a hotel down. You know, have a developer come in, they, they build a hotel, it becomes this kind of ecotourism hub, yeah. and that yeah. can start to, to generate some income on the land and start to justify some of these bigger uh, infrastructure investments. I think I think the developers will be able to project some interest in this place, either for residents or for tourism or, or, or commerce or something like that. And um, I think that there could be some incentives to develop. Another interesting one is like blockchain mining. If they can just get power here and someone could just build a data center, you know, for something like blockchain mining. They're very interested in blockchain as part of their governance procedure. That's why we focused on that. As part of, that's actually part of the competition. As part of the governance procedures, um, obviously the currency and stuff like that. They have their own currency called the Merit, which is a, like an altcoin kind of a thing. And so uh, I think that blockchain mining here would be a, a great amenity that you could develop on the site, justify bringing in power before you have to worry about too much about water and sewer and food and, you know, fuel and stuff like that. You know, you could have these just these places that start to generate some, um, some income on this land that then make it possible to make the bigger infrastructure investments as more people become interested in settling here. Would the infrastructure in Neverland be explicitly private and you just have like this these blockchain based rules that they have to follow. That's what we're kind of proposing. We're trying to push that envelope and okay. see if we can get to that. Can we get to the point where the water treatment, where the sewage treatment, where, where the power provision, you know, where the um, fuel, if you have natural gas coming in? I mean, you know, as it is now, a lot of electricity providers are, are, are private companies. Um, a lot of natural gas providers are private companies. Um, obviously, they're heavily regulated, but we kind of like that idea. The easy answer for this place is kind of the, the, the free private city models where you have one provider coming in and, and as you said, kind of claiming claiming this parcel of land as a kind of corporation and then selling out those land parcels and selling the infrastructure. Service. So they take they take on responsibility for all of those infrastructure parts and pieces. That's a very viable model here because of the small size of this place. And because yeah. of the compactness, it makes the infrastructure very efficient. Um, and kind of affordable to put in. But we, we like trying to push the idea of, well, even here, like, could we get to the point where all these things are, are just provided by private organizations as opposed to a government that's, that's owning it and then starts to create a justification for taxation? An interesting example of that, there's a town called Sandy Springs, Georgia. Uh, it's outside of Atlanta. It's actually a pretty, a pretty good sized city, I think. Um, that they, there was some dispute in the 90s. They, they're kind of at one point they were annexed by Atlanta, and then, then I think they were de-annexed or something like that. So they're now their own city. But when they were set up as their own city, 
they um, they put this system of governance in place where they uh, they basically like city hall has like three people in it, and all they do is is review contracts and everything except for I think the fire service, the justice services, and I think the police service, and I'm not sure what the involvement is. Wrote. Everything else is private companies. They basically just have contractors come in either to, to build and operate stuff and they just they take competitive bids on these projects and they, they build it out and all that stuff is just operated by essentially private private organizations. So yeah. even the school system I think. Uh no I think I I forget. I think schools might be something that they've that they've they've kept under the government umbrella, but it's very little. Like like as much as you can easily um privatize or, or contract out as a private service, they've gone a long way down the road. It's an interesting example. I definitely wouldn't mind living in a in a corporate city that like there's an explicit contract that says these are the services we're going to provide. You know, here are here's your recourse if we don't provide those services. Yeah. And like here is the amount that we can charge you from now until eternity and you know Etc. Yeah. Like if if all that stuff, if we had an explicit social contract, <laughs> then it would be fine. It, it, that that that's the free private city model, exactly. Yeah. And I'll give you some examples of that. I mean, we think of this as like this radical idea, right? But if you've ever been to Florida, like half the people in Florida live on these these golf communities. My parents live in one of those places. It's a little golf community. Yeah. And they're you know the homeowners association that that runs the thing. And they actually have within that community, they have a separate homeowners organization just for their for their little neighborhood within this bigger development. Yeah. It's, and so Florida, I mean Florida has a ton of this stuff. It's basically almost like a private city. We just visited the villages villages not that long ago. Vill- yeah, exactly. Villages is the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It's it's like you're on your you're, you're it's like you. It's its own country almost. Yeah, it's like its own little world. Yeah, exactly. That's like that's like how they do things in Florida, you know. Yeah. Another example, a historical example that's relevant here, um, Manchester, New Hampshire. Manchester, New Hampshire was built out by the Amistad Milk Company. There was some settlement there um, originally, but when the Industrial Revolution happened, people started to build mills on these these New England rivers. I think the river had been dammed at one point. I think they they dammed it. Are you guys all familiar with Manchester? I'm from New Hampshire here. Oh, enough from okay. We've heard of Manchester. All right. Anyways, it's a mill town. It was built up as a mill town. Um, literally, these guys purchased these, all these parcels of land along the river on the east and the west side of the river. This is the Merrimack River, which goes that, which is the river that feeds like Lowell, Massachusetts, which is known as like the Industrial Revolution for textile mills in the 1800s. It's the same river that uh, comes through Manchester. It's, it's a fast flowing river, and so these guys, this this company, got together. They bought up all these land parcels along the river. They even went like up and down the river buying up land parcels so nobody else could develop a competing uh, a competing mill within that stretch of the river. And then they, they built their mill buildings. They started on the west side of the river, and then they, they realized it would be better to build on the east side of the river. So the layout of Manchester, you have the river, you have these mill buildings, and what the way they work um, back then is all water power. Manchester has a, there's a dam, and then the, the river drops down, and you have the mill buildings. So water from higher up in the dam used to feed into these canals, the canal would go down, it would feed through one row of mill buildings, it would power you know, water wheels and stuff that powered all the machinery for textile manufacturing uh, within those buildings, it went down to another canal, dumped into another level of buildings down below, again, more power from, from the water there, and then dumped back out into the river. So that's how they harnessed that, that water power in the river, just mechanically, to, to power these textile mills. Again, this whole place was built, it was, was purchased as by this corporation. It's actually that Manchester has a, it was the largest mill owned by a by a single um, company. Even like Lowell's all different companies. And the MC Mill in Manchester was just all one thing. And they actually they own basically the whole city. So you have the river, you have the mills, then you have the hill there's like a hill that steps up, you have residences, like apartment the board, the boarding house at the time. That step up the hill from there. So people coming to work in the mills would come and live in the boarding houses. Actually had an apartment in one of these places at one point. Then above the residences, you have like the Main Street area, the commercial strip there, which at the time would have like a company store, you know, and all that stuff where people are buying stuff, uh, buying everything they need. And then beyond that, you have like the manager's house. You get into some like nicer like Victorian houses and bigger single family houses. And then beyond that, you get like, you know, the, the mansions and stuff, right? There's a, at the time, we're like these bigger Victorian mansions and kind of like, like North Manchester and some other areas like that. And so, um, Again, it's, it, was, it was incorporated as a city, but it was kind of set up at that time as this corporation 
built this city and they built it because they needed people to come and work in their mills and then they provided all the you know the, the things that they needed there. When was um, it incorporated as a city? This is in the eighteen hundreds. I don't I, I don't know exactly. Did they build the mills and stuff and like the boarding houses and then it incorporated as a city? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know exactly. But it was it was pretty early on, I think. Okay. Um but anyway so Do you know anything about rest in Virginia? No. It's uh it doesn't have a city government. <laughs> so it's a suburb of DC that it's really nice and it's very well planned. And it's run by a corporation. Hmm. Um, and I don't know exactly how it works, um, exactly how the funding works, but I do know that there's not a proper city government in Reston. And Reston, I used to live in West Virginia. Reston was always my favorite city. Uh, like, it's just so... you can The streets are very walkable because there's not a lot of traffic, even though it's really dense because yeah. they put all the parking garages like around the downtown area. Okay, yeah. It's just very... Oh, I forgot to mention, folks. Um... In Lieberland, we have no car traffic because we're so dense and everything. But we decided that the city itself is going to be walkable. Our transportation hub will have a big parking garage for anybody coming in. But the city itself, other than that ring road, we're just going to leave it as a, as a walkable city that allows us to make it more dense. We don't need all the space for cars. It's more safe. It's more enjoyable. This is like every urbanist wet dream is to design <laughs> a city that has no cars in it, right? Um, if I it actually makes a villages. lot of sense to do that here because you have no roads going through it from one side to the other. It's a dead end. You get there, you park your car, it's like Disney World. You park your car in the parking lot, and then you go into the legal end. Right? By the way, Disney World is another great example of a... Yeah. 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 It's the yeah. flooding, too. There are no roads and cars. Yeah, there. right, right. And then you don't have to worry about all the cars getting flooded. Yeah. yeah for sure, for sure. Yeah, that, that's, an, that's an interesting example. So, what's the point of this competition? Is it to, like, develop plans that other people can work off of? Because... The idea behind Neverland is it's not centralized, like there's not a centralized plan, yeah. so like, what exactly... So you need, and, and that's something that we, you know, like, by doing the blockchain thing as opposed to, like, we, we drew a street grid, but the idea is that that would be a flexible street grid that could adapt as, as the place is being developed. I think that, for them, it, it's really about, about getting ideas, it's about being able to, to publicize something that's like, look at, like, this is, this could be a really special place. Um, you get some publicity out of that, yeah, maybe and start get investment to. Based on it or, uh, What's that? Maybe yeah, maybe based? investment. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, certainly. Once they once they're able to develop this place, it's like they have some ideas in place that they can start to they can start to act on. It's not like they're starting from. Okay, we got it. Now what do we do? You know what I mean? Right. And because again, because it's so small, um, like I love the idea of individuals just going out and homesteading parcels, but because this is so small and there's so much demand, and um, desired density here, I think that there needs to be some degree of planning, whether that's by, as you said, like a free private city type of corporation, or whether that's in some less formal way, like what we're trying to propose here. How, how did they determine who, who the winners were? Um, they have a, a whole series of judges, actually. Um, so there's this is guy, Patrick Schumacher. He's, he's, been on, he's on Tom Wood show a while ago. He's an architect. Was he on your podcast? He, he was on our, yeah. yeah, I wrote, I wrote yeah so we, interviewed, we did like a four-part series on because this guy's like yeah, yeah. our spirit animal. Yeah. <laughs> but he um, he is the head of Zaha Hadid Architects, which is one of the most, like one of the biggest and most like advanced. Um, yeah, and he's like, a, he's like an ANCAM, right? In the world. Yeah, and he is like like hardcore, like yeah. Rothbardian kind of anarcho-capitalist. Um, I don't know if he would accept that label, but but, but very, very interested in libertarian ideas. He's done a lot of writing on some of these ideas, and especially on the kind of stuff we like, like how do these ideas of, of libertarianism, what does that mean for the built environment? Like how do, we, how do we design cities, how do we build cities, how do we make places that where people can, um, can exist freely? And so so he was one of the judges. He's, he's done a lot of work with people in over the years. He was a judge, Daniela, um, who's, um, Patrick was actually her thesis advisor. Um, she was the curator of the competition. They have an organization called Arc Agenda, which promotes certain uh, certain architectural concepts and ideals. And then just a handful of the people they actually had. So I mentioned they had a, a competition in 2015. A handful of the people who had, and actually that's worth checking out too, if you're looking into these, these design entries, some really cool stuff from the 2015 entries as well. Some of those guys who submitted entries then or were judges for this competition. And so they, they have a kind of group of people who's been, been looking at this place and then thinking about it and you know, just, just put in ideas together. And, and of course, Fitch Epica, the president, um, is one of the judges. And he's actually, from the, the, the stuff I've heard him talking about, he's actually very interested in these kind of like, like these 
these ideas. What does this place actually look like? What is the architecture? How does it lay out? Um, you know, he's not just interested in the governance side. I think he, he seems yeah. like he really, um, really has an interest in, in this level of thinking about, about this place. Do you know what were the um, incentives, what were the prizes for the uh, competition? Yes, the, I, I forget the dollar amounts, but essentially there was a... So the prizes were awarded in merits, which is Lutherland's currency, mm -hmm. which I think it... Um, I forget if it's like a stable coin. It's, like it's, it's connected to the U.S. dollar. Okay, is it, is it more or less connected to the U.S. dollar? Okay. Yeah. So I think that like the first prize was like 5,000 merits, second prize was 4,000, 3,000, 2,000. I think it was something like that. Okay. But one of the winning teams... From those five wooden entries, they're going to select one of them to do a design for that Napper Deck site, that other little site. That's mm -hmm. why that was part of the competition. Because they're going to pick somebody and negotiate a design contract with them cool. that they can actually do a real project, design that space, and create this this space where they have this floating man festival and could have some other type of investment, like a startup incubator or something. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. How do you move to Liberal Land? Is there any requirements like. Uh so there are requirements for citizenship. How many people? Sorry, how many yeah. people live there right now as well? Nobody lives there now. It's it's empty. It is empty land, and the Croatian border control is trying to make it stay that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are, I don't know. You might have missed that earlier, but basically, when people whenever someone of these guys tries to go and, and hang out in the land, Croatian border control comes and shows up and, and kicks them off. So even though Croatia isn't claiming this land. They're not real thrilled people showing up on it. <laughs> well, them and Serbia um, both say that they don't own the land, but they both also agree that someone else does. Croatia has said, the way that they've put it, is that this land, that the boundary dispute does not involve terra nullis, which is, terra nullis is the term that basically no man's land, that nobody claims it. They're saying, basically, Croatia's saying, if we don't get our way with this boundary dispute, then we want that land back. Like, if Serbia gets, gets the middle of the river and that's the boundary, then... We want we want this back as part of our own land, essentially. Um, so in other words, they're not going to give up all their parcels on their on the Serbian side, and then also lose this par this this parcel that Serbian is claiming that. That's what that's what they've said, and that's a challenge for these negotiations with Russia. Serbia has said that legal land claim doesn't affect them because it basically enforces or reinforces Serbian claim. So um, I'm I'm not a skeptic about most sort of charter city things, corporate cities, private free cities, mm -hmm. kind of like uh, there's a lot of very interesting proposals. And historically, you've seen a lot of things in that area work out kind of, uh, you know, obviously with more statist involvement and kind of conception and enforcement. Like, I'm just skeptical about this one in particular, because like you, first of all, you have to, there's a lot of particular issues which each on their own might potentially be solvable if, you know, you're very clever and you figure them out. But there's a lot of them. You have to, you know, you have to, you know, solve a land dispute in the Balkans. You know, kind of a, uh, you have to kind of a uh, use sort of novel transportation methods, or you know, negotiate river access through you know what's currently dammed off to get you know serious shipping in. You have to. I should say, sorry. There's, there, there's pretty active shipping here. So even though there, there are a couple locks you have to go through if you're going all the way to the Black Sea, um, it is there is a pretty active shipping channel. Here, yeah. so. But sorry, go ahead. But there's just a lot of, you know, each issue on its own is mm -hmm. there's a potential right. solution for it. But if you've got like eight tricky problems in a row, each which is difficult to solve, probabilistically that adds up to a very small chance it works mm -hmm. out. Like there's the ideolo you know, there's the ideological people, the people who are willing to just take a hit and do something which maybe doesn't have a good expected value on return mm -hmm. because they believe in the concepts. But that's not going to get you institutional money and you're going to need billions of dollars kind of a, you know, low end to get things set up with the development plan you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I honestly, I mean, I, as you I hope we make clear in this, like we kind of share that skepticism, mm -hmm. that this is a challenging site. Um, there are, uh, we think there are some really interesting opportunities, but for all the reasons we talked about, it, it's a challenging site. One thing we actually proposed <laughs> as a little line item in our in our pro pro proposal was once Lieberland, if, if they can get recognition, once they get recognition, um, negotiate a land swap with one of these countries, Serbia or Croatia, say, hey, look it, we, we want to have this little special place of our own, but we recognize that this is a piece of land that is very sensitive, you know, wetlands and everything. It's probably not a great place to develop, but maybe, you know, do you have, do you have anything else? Is there, is there something else up along the river somewhere where maybe we could, uh, could just, you know, a piece of land that isn't quite so sensitive that maybe we could develop something there. Maybe it has better ties to infrastructure. You know, closer to a city, to an airport, something like that. You know, 
that might be something worth discussing. And maybe that's something that, that could even get Croatia on board. Say, look, it, we're going to forget about Serbia. We want to build this really special place. It's going to bring a lot of investment to your country, um, to your border, um, and create jobs for people to come work in our, you know, it's called a private city, right? in our city. This place where you get this development. Any piece of land you could you could give up that we could come, maybe something that's bigger, better connections to infrastructure, that doesn't have necessarily all of the, the problems that this piece of land has, that might be an interesting discussion to have, and, and maybe there's something that could come out of that. And maybe that could be a step to resolving this value dispute, you know? If there's, if there's some other solution on the table, like this three-way kind of trade between Serbia, Croatia, Liberland, you know, whoever, and say, look it, like maybe there's some solution in there that this piece of land gets to have, and, and, you know, maybe Liberland says, look, we're going to, in perpetuity, we, Liberland, are going to fund the preservation of this piece of land as a wetland preserve. We're going to do what needs to be done for investment there and preserve this place. That way everybody's happy, all the environmentalists are happy. Croatia's not concerned that there's that there's some kind of threat there from this country that's that's connected to Serbia. And maybe they have um you know, maybe there's another piece of land that works out better for everybody and and they go there. That's a, that could be an interesting discussion to have, even before they, they get this land recognized. Well, best of luck. <laughs> Thank you I for want that. I want to be wrong. It'd be awesome. Me too, me too. Thanks for listening to An Architecture Podcast, the built environment of a stateless society. Visit anarchitecturepodcast.com to follow our blog and social media and find out how you can support us through Patreon or with cryptocurrency. Yeah, the first time you went on the Tom Wood show, I'm like, that sounds interesting. And I went, was cool, I appreciate it. That's yeah. architecture. Mm-hmm. I actually, like, I forgot, like, I got a new phone, I was like, oh, that was, here's the one that I'd forgotten to, oh, yeah. have the new podcast app, so I just re-added you, but you, cool, you right only here. have one this year, it looks like. We, we, because I, I remember <laughs> we, put out a bunch, we put out a bunch last we year. We put out episode seasonal. <laughs> so we're kind of on, like, a, like, three-month release uh, schedule, and actually this, because we were spending so much time on this over the past, that makes sense, so um, you have other, past year, year and a half, or yeah. I guess six months to a year, um, this kind of took that energy away yeah, from, from cool. some podcasts. So we, we have a ton of stuff we'd love to do with the podcast, but it's, with my brother being in Australia, it's hard to, to mm-hmm. make the stars align, so we go sit down and record together for you know three hours or whatever we do. Yeah. It's not like Tom Woods, where you just get an interviewee and just have them talk for 30 minutes and yeah. you don't do anything. Oh. They actually put up yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>